right, this is Kyle Daly with the Wildlife Society. Um, I am today. I am is August seventeenth of twenty seventeen. I will be interviewing Carol Henderson uh, with the Minnesota DNR, and we are performing a uh, celebrating our wildlife conservation heritage interview as part of that program for the Wildlife Society. So, thanks, Carol, for being here and being open to this conversation. Oh, you're sure welcome. So, um, I do have some some kind of questions that the Wildlife Society asks us to, to ask you, um, and hopefully that will just evolve into a nice conversation with one another about, about your ha history, your past, um, kind of how you um, got into the wildlife field and, and kind of how it's evolved since you've been in it and what do you see in the future. So if you can put on those hats for us. Um, so let's just start. Um, Kind of tell us about your childhood, where you grew up, and your experiences, and if any of those experiences led to your interest in wildlife. Sure. Well, I uh, grew up on a small farm in central Iowa, uh, near the little town of Zering, had about 500 people, um, and our farm was a small one, 132 acres. And my parents, uh, Curtis and Leona Henderson, uh, raised six of us kids on the farm, and I was constantly outdoors, either helping my dad or uh, just exploring all the little wild nooks and crannies of the farm and adjacent farmlands where there were abandoned farmsteads that still had a lot of interesting wildlife. Um, and then in those early years, um, my grandparents, as well as my parents, uh, took the opportunity to share little nature books, wildlife books with me, my, the Golden Nature Guide for Birds, I literally wore the covers off of that. <laughs> And uh, grandparents had a book about wildlife the world over. That one was by Leon Prey. And uh, so I had the vision of what wildlife was like in other parts of the world, which was fascinating to me. And it, little did I realize that someday I would see a lot of those animals, uh, even ranging up to uh, jaguars and other wildlife. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then my uh, grandfather, Martin Holland, uh, took the opportunity to build a birdhouse for me or with me one time where we he put the little wren house together in the basement of his home in Story City, Iowa and I got to help paint it and I still have that little wren house. And we put it up on the farm and just within days a family of house friends showed up, they raised the family and I thought that was just like magic. <laughs> and uh, then there was one day that my dad came home from cultivating corn in the spring and he had found a kill killer nest right by a mm. hill of corn so he took me out there and showed me the nest and showed me the parents doing their broken wing act yeah. which I thought was incredible and, and then every day after school I'd run out to check the nest and finally one day the eggs had hatched and I got to see the little chicks which nice. you know all those things just helped motivate and fascinate my interest in the outdoors and wildlife. Yeah. And as I got older you know I was paying more attention to all the birds that nested around our farm, from the yellow throats to the red-winged blackbirds, and, and we had a little creek that flowed through our farm, and that led to an interest in uh, trapping. So, uh, trapping and hunting were two of my big, big pursuits in uh, middle school and high school. And I was constantly out in the fall chasing pheasants, uh, rabbits. I hunted jackrabbits back when there were still lots yeah. of jackrabbits. <laughs> uh, and uh, and also the, the trapping, I trapped uh, extensively around our farm and on mm -hmm. adjacent farms. And uh, I think in my last year of trapping as a senior, I caught about 200 muskrats and several minks and some raccoons. And, and all of this just fostered this real strong bond with understanding the outdoors, learning about wildlife. And, and uh, you know, I, I just wanted to learn as much as I could about mm -hmm. you know, hunting, trapping, outdoors, and then as well as the other wildlife, the, the songbirds. Mm -hmm. And so I had a, a very broad, comprehensive interest, not just in the game species, but the, the big picture. And uh, as I got older, there was uh, one of our teachers at the local high school, Nesco High School, George Kanafus, who uh, had been a wonderful, wonderful science teacher. He was a veteran from the Battle of the Bulge uh, in World War II. And, uh, he would always uh, jazz up his biology lessons with a few stories of <laughs> his experiences in the war. And he was an avid hunter. Mm -hmm. and, and he stimulated me to get more interested in science and he was a botanist. And, and then while I was finishing up school, 
and heading off to Iowa State University, mm -hmm. he got his doctor's degree and then went into the botany department at Iowa State. So then I had him again as my oh. botany professor. <laughs> Very nice. And uh, he was just a wonderful early influence because he urged me to just keep learning and, and follow my, my love of yeah. outdoors. And, you know, at the point that uh, I started school, I was only 25 miles from Iowa State from our farm. Mm -hmm. So it was an easy transition to to go to the school there and yet come home on weekends and hunt pheasants and rabbits and, yeah. and enjoy the small game and, and the family life there. Um, and at first I started my, my career, uh, after all this interest in the outdoors, people said, well, you know, there's not that many jobs in wildlife management and it doesn't pay all that well. Mm -hmm. And they were just really discouraging me pursuing that. And so I started in engineering science for one quarter, uh, calculus and, and uh, higher level physics, and it just was not a good match. I was not motivated. And after one quarter, I switched to a major in zoology with a minor in botany and another minor in physics. And now I was just really enjoying yeah. my, my classwork, my, cla my uh, test scores, everything, grade points shot way up. And I, I was really in my niche in terms of doing what I love. And uh, so with that background of zoology and botany, mm -hmm. physics, I, I felt you know I was ready to forge ahead. And then I got involved with uh, Dr. Kenneth Knight, an entomologist at Iowa State. And he was a world expert in mosquitoes. So I did a mosquito research project at, in Ames about the flight periodicity of Aedes vexans mosquitoes. And meanwhile, he transferred to the faculty at the University of Georgia <laughs> and started telling me about this wonderful worldly renowned ecologist named Eugene Odom, who was the author of the book, Principles of Ecology. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I connected with Dr. Odom and uh, was influenced to apply then for graduate school at the University of Georgia, uh, but not in entomology. What I wanted to do is go into wildlife management. Right. management. So uh, anyway, that worked out very well. Um, I, I headed for Georgia and then signed up for some classes in forestry, wildlife management, uh, dendrology. But then I did something that no one quite understood why I did it. <laughs> I began taking courses on the liberal arts campus yeah. in journalism, feature writing, public relations, and working with the media. And it's what I now refer to as cross-pollinating your major. Right. Because when you sit down for an interview for a job that might be in wildlife management, if you have all of these other skill sets, mm -hmm. you're going to stand out above and beyond someone who's just focused on a very narrow right. research field. And so I, I think that those were some skills that have been a very important part of my job in mm -hmm. all these years since then. Because if you're promoting a new direction in wildlife conservation, which is adding non-game to the existing suite of our game management programs, you have to get people excited about why that's important, how they can participate, and then let people know what you've learned and how this all fits together. Right. And so that was a really important opportunity to uh, uh, provide that skill set to a wildlife conservation mm -hmm. uh, curriculum. Yeah, and that's reflected today in a lot of major universities' wildlife curriculums and conservation biology, especially kind of getting that experience in political science and um, economics and, and writing and, and everything else. So Oh yeah, and, and the, So you're just paving the way. I well I, it, <laughs> it worked for me and, and yeah. I found that in promoting you know the, for the first three years, uh, well jumping ahead when I was hired by the Department of Natural Resources uh, in nineteen seventy four, I was to be the first, uh, well, I was the assistant manager for the Lackey Park Wildlife Refuge for three years, which mm -hmm. gave me a really good background in everything from pheasants to wood ducks, mallard management, Canada goose management. Uh, but, you know, beyond that, uh, this job was created mm -hmm. in St. Paul by uh, Section of Wildlife Chief Roger Holmes, non-game wildlife supervisor. It was a brand new position. There was no precedent, no guidelines. There right. was a clean slate. And I applied for it thinking, oh, well, I don't have a chance because uh, I'm you know, just several years into the DNR. And there were 10 other applicants who scored better than I did. Yeah. But when I went for the interview and had all these extra little 
uh, things to share and, and enhance my qualifications, they picked mm -hmm. me uh, to be the first supervisor. That was January of 1977. And now here it is, 2017, and I'm right. still in the very same position I was <laughs> hired in. And yeah. so I, I guess in some ways I'm kind of a dinosaur because most people keep, try to keep moving up and moving up. Mm -hmm. But I found the niche where I felt I could do the most good right. for the state's wildlife and even beyond Minnesota with this type of a position. And I saw the kind of bureaucratic responsibilities mm -hmm. that existed at higher level positions, and, and that wasn't my forte. And right. so, uh, you know, one of the important things I think that people look for, need to look for is to find that niche where they mm -hmm. are getting great job satisfaction, but then also um, are able to make a difference. Right. I think that's a very good take home point. You know, a lot of young conservationists that I know, um, whether in their federal service or state service or or NGOs are looking for that niche. And it takes, you know, patience and takes a little bit of time to figure that out. Um, but that's always something that, that I think we strive for in our careers is to where can we have the most benefit um, toward to wildlife and to mm -hmm. our vocation. So yeah. and I think I really appreciate the support and encouragement I've gotten through the Department of Natural Resources to, to follow my instincts. And Roger Holmes mm -hmm. was the first one to really kind of let me follow my lead and try to develop that broad-term vision of what was non-game mm -hmm. and, and what were the opportunities to make something happen. And for the first three years, my whole program, including my salary, expenses, everything, was $30,000 a year for the whole statewide program <laughs> and all of the non-game species they're in. Yeah. And then a really incredible thing happened in 1970. Um, both the state of Colorado and Oregon had passed a checkoff in their legislature for a voluntary fund for non-game, non-hunted wildlife species. Mm -hmm. And there was a news story that occurred um, in the local Star Tribune newspaper about this new funding technique out west. And then there was a newspaper, a newspaper and both a radio story that uh, state senator Colin Peterson heard about. Oh. And this was at the end of the legislative session. And he thought, oh, this sounded real interesting because he's always had a very strong track record in natural resource sure. interest in conservation. And his intern at the time had worked for me for a year through the federal Young Adult Conservation Corps program, Diane Bosick. And so she knew about what we were trying to do with a one-person program yeah. <laughs> and, and how important it could be. And so he asked Diane to get the wording for that legislation that was in Colorado mm -hmm. because that same day he was going into the conference committee at the end of the session where they were voting on the final version of the, the state uh, budget bill. And as a member of that committee, he had the discretion to introduce an amendment to create the, a non-game checkoff for wildlife in Minnesota. And he pulled this out and introduced it actually several times that evening in the conference committee and other people on the committee said oh that's silly that's just like a chickadee checkoff and they yeah. voted it down <laughs> and every time they came up to vote on amendments uh, he pulled it out again and introduced mm -hmm. it and finally like at 2 30 in the morning he pulled it out again and they said you're just going to keep doing this until we pass it aren't you and he said yes so they passed it and I literally woke up in the morning <laughs> and had non-game wildlife checkoff which increased our state budget from mm -hmm. about 30000 a year to a half million dollars in the first year. Wow. Yeah. And that was the point at which it just opened incredible doors sure. to reach people and to make a difference. And so some of our early projects were to split money with the State Game and Fish Fund to purchase the Lamprey Pass Wildlife Management Area, which was 1,300 acres of wonderful habitat of an old hunting club that went back mm -hmm. to 1881 in Minnesota up by Forest Lake. And so we wanted to have a good program that was habitat-based and yet was dealing with the wildlife species that otherwise had no funding. Right. Every, everything from bluebirds to uh, bald eagles, uh, trumpeter swans, peregrine falcons. Mm -hmm. And what I tried to do uh, is to build a program, now that we had funding, with what I call the four H's uh, of conservation. Uh, it, the program needs to be based on habitat. 
it needs to have a, a component of hands-on involvement with private citizens on private lands. It needs to be uh, dealing with high-profile animals that people can identify with and appreciate. Mm -hmm. in that, and in those early years, uh, those were like the bald eagle, bluebird, uh, peregrine falcon, where we could score some early successes. We wanted yeah. to show success with what we had to work yeah. with. And then the fourth component is that the program has to be holistic. We need to deal with the whole range of wildlife that share habitats. Mm -hmm. Not just game, not just non-game, but game and non-game together. And to pool our energy, our interest, and our resources and our funding for good projects that share the, the long-term benefits. That's, that's interesting because that's, those, those four H's are very similar to the, the model that is being used or is the same model being used now for the monarch butterfly initiatives in the Fish and Wildlife Service that I'm that I'm more familiar with or even more broad than the Fish and Wildlife Service is taking this iconic species that we can show successes mm -hmm. with it engages the public it engages you know habitat at, at many scales from urban scales where they're planting uh, milkweed seeds to mm -hmm. um, having more milkweed in our restoration projects on larger scales. So yeah. it's very similar to that. So yeah, and I think it's important that when you're trying to develop these programs, you don't get so complicated that the public tunes out. And by right. having it like the simple four H's, this is what we're all about. Mm -hmm. That's something people can understand and then they understand where they can fit in mm -hmm. to, to that How they fit into that picture. puzzle. Yeah. yeah, excellent. And something else I wanted to, to follow up on is, um, you know, see, seeing some silos created between game and non-game and crossing those bridges and what kind of advice, um, what kind of difficulties did you have doing those types of things, being more holistic in, in wildlife management? Well, I think that's a really important challenge and I think it's an ongoing challenge because like in the DNR we were taken out of the section of wildlife and put into the Division of Ecological and Water Resources which makes it more challenging to keep up to date on what's happening within the scope of the section of wildlife which you know, deals more with game-oriented issues and wildlife mm -hmm. diseases and CWD and a lot of other things. And, and so we have to work extra hard to try to build or rebuild the bridges that we, we need to have so that we are being holistic and dealing with these shared habitats. And because we have many, many budgets that are very narrow in their constraints, mm -hmm. um, how you can spend certain accounts, uh, that makes it more difficult sometimes to have a a holistic approach although mm -hmm. within Minnesota we have a huge benefit from this fact that we have funding that comes from the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund which mm -hmm. is derived from the state lottery where money is allocated uh, about 50 million dollars a year for conservation projects and then we have the LSOHC the Lazard and Sam's Heritage Fund uh, Conservation uh, Fund derived from a three-eighths of one percent sales tax in mm -hmm. Minnesota from all Minnesota citizens and part of that goes to wildlife conservation which is primarily directed primarily directed at habitat projects mm -hmm. but non-game and game can both play a role in that and when you can use funds from those plus the non-game wildlife checkoff which generates about a million dollars a year in voluntary donations now we have a matching program to our state conservation license plates which we also administer in the non-game program so that when people see the license plates with the moose mm -hmm. and the chickadee and the loon, we get that matched one-to-one -to, -one to the tax donation. So that automatically puts our budget up to about $2 million a year. And then we get the state wildlife grants money from the federal government, which might be seven or 800000 per year. And then we can get additional funds from estate donations and now we also have a lot of donations coming in because we operate both a bald eagle and a peregrine falcon webcam and this generates a huge huge interest in wildlife because right. people can't get enough of bald eagles they love their eagles yeah. and they love watching everything from the eggs to the chicks to the fledging right. of the eagles and so that generates additional support so all of these funds support each other in terms of overall conservation mm -hmm. including both game and non-game and that we need to keep people talking together and one of our big challenges right now is that you know for, since I worked at Lackey Pearl I've dealt with issues relating to lead poisoning 
and wildlife. And at that point, we had a research project looking at the problem that we had about 70,000 Canada geese at Lac Parle, about 70, uh, about 36 or more bald eagles that wintered there, and they were feeding on the dead and injured Canada geese, mm -hmm. injured as a result or killed as a result of the hunting. And I started a research project to see if eagles were eating the geese and then subsequently getting lead poisoning. And it found out, and we found out that yes, they were. An eagle was a federally threatened bird at the time, mm -hmm. which meant that if we documented that eagles were being damaged by use of lead, it could have led to an injunction to actually close goose hunting. And that obviously was not satisfactory in, in, right. on many levels, for, either for game or, or overall wildlife conservation. So Roger Holmes and Commissioner Joe Alexander and others conferred on this and they said, okay, we're just gonna make an arbitrary decision. We're switching to non-toxic shot for waterfowl hunting mm -hmm. in 1987, which was before almost any other state did so. Right. And obviously this was a rude transition for a lot of hunters because the, the technology for non-toxic shot shells was not that advanced at the time. And, right. and it took years to ca catch up with some really good effective loads. But we did it, mm -hmm. and it was the right thing to do. And you know, we just have to adapt with the times and realize that you know we can't stay in the 1930s and right. and leave things <laughs> like they were. So at that point, I thought, well, now we're not going to be losing bald eagles to lead poisoning from shot shells you know, with waterfowl hunting. And in working with the people at the Raptor Center, like Dr. Pat Redding and uh, mm -hmm. Lake Gary Duke. Uh, it didn't go down. The mortality stayed up. And we weren't sure what was going on, but it turns out that the, the missing link was that the eagles were also depending heavily in the fall, early winter, on gut piles from deer hunting. And that when a rifle shell especially hits a deer, the lead bullet shatters into mm -hmm. not only tiny pieces, but almost lead dust. And it goes into the gut pile, it also goes into the venison. And that's just been a, a reality, a, a realization now in like the last five or six years that the, the information has come not just from here, but from other states mm -hmm. where we're saying uh, we're losing eagles every year to the use of lead. And yet the technology for non-toxic ammunition has come a long ways. And a lot of the bullets like copper bullets now, they're not only as good as lead, they're superior. Mm -hmm. They perform well, they penetrate better, they knock deer down in their tracks. Um, and, uh, you know, people, uh, when they try it, they're only using maybe half a dozen shells per season. They, a couple of shells to sight in their gun. Yeah, I think and, I heard the know, average deer hunter only shoots five yeah. rounds a year. So you, you shoot a couple of times yeah. to sight in, and maybe one or two times to shoot your deer. Yep. So a box of 20 shells might last four or five years. Mm -hmm. And so this is something where if you're using really good ammunition, and, and then also because the, the copper penetrates without shattering, it doesn't damage as much meat. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in looking at bald eagles, Minnesota Raptor Center gets about 30 eagles that die a year. And, and it's from the lead poisoning in the deer season. So we're trying to educate hunters to say, don't believe us, give it a try, see what you think. And virtually everybody you talk to will say, if they've already switched to copper, they're never going back to lead because mm -hmm. it performs so well. And so it's not a matter of a philosophical dis uh, problem here. You know, some people have said, oh, well, this is a threat to uh, the Second Amendment. Right. Uh, right to yeah, keep and bear that. arms. Yeah. And we're saying, this has nothing to do with the Second Amendment. This is about hunting. You're still hunting. If you shoot a deer with a copper bullet, it's still dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's not going to mess up the meat, and it's not going to expose your family to lead fragments in the venison. Right. And, you know, that should be common sense after what we've learned with lead in the water in Flint, Michigan. Uh, you don't want to be feeding this material, this right. toxic material to your family, which could affect your kid's IQ or, mm -hmm. you know, cognitive abilities in, in any family member. And so it, it's, it's something where it, it should be a no-brainer. And we're just trying right. to help people go through this transition where we're saying, no, this isn't about the Second Amendment. This isn't about arguing about those problems. This is about simply an improvement in technology. It's like bow hunting. Uh, mm -hmm. When I went to school at Iowa State, I was bow hunting for deer and small game. Uh, 
with a recurve bow. And then along came the compound bow and mm -hmm. the whole industry kind of switched over and now yeah. you know, a few people are going back to the recurve just because it's a nice retro right. hobby. But right. it's an advance in technology. Right. And that's what we're seeing with ammunition and switching from lead to copper. It's an advance in technology. And we're seeing a nice advance in utilization mm -hmm. of that copper or non-toxic uh, material in, in ammunition every year now. Yeah. And virtually all of the ammo makers are retooling and, and coming out with all of these non-toxic uh, varieties. Right. So I, I, if things just stay like they are, we're going to see an advance in a few percent or per year as people keep mm -hmm. trying this out. And, and once you get what we really need, you know, based on my experience with media, is that they don't want to hear this message coming necessarily from a state agency mm -hmm. or, or maybe a federal agency. What they believe is what they hear from other hunters. And if you can get testimonials from right. other hunters, uh, that's what, what's going to cause a change. Yeah. And, and when you tell those hunters that, yeah, you don't want to be feeding your, your spouse and your children and your grandchildren meatballs of venison that have right. lead, you, know, you don't want that little granddaughter to eat that stuff. Mm -hmm. Nobody should be eating that. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, those are the kind of messages where, uh, you know, we hope common sense prevails. Yeah. And that's where, unfortunately, we've had some people say, well, we don't care if we're causing poisoning with bald eagles because it's not affecting them at a population level. Well, that's a bunch of baloney because there's nothing scientific or in, in law about whether or not poisoning eagles reaches a population level before you have to be worried about it. Because we have the Bald Eagle and Golden Eagle Act of 1940 that says mm -hmm. poisoning eagles is illegal, even a single eagle. And if we're going to respect our own federal law, we should be concerned about areas where we know that poisoning is occurring and allowing it mm -hmm. the continued use of, of lead ammunition. So. You know, maybe that will help motivate people to uh, accelerate this yeah. transition. And, and so, again, this goes back to the, use it, working with the media, and understanding the big picture, and how you know deer hunting and preserving bald eagles is not a contradictory right. effort. This is something where, it, with non-toxic ammunition, you can have your eagles, you can have your venison. Right. Everybody goes home happy. Yeah. And a, a, as a hunter, and a, from an agency that is obviously supported by hunters, it's important to realize that we need. You know, the, some people are standoffish against hunters, and we need to have that kind of message that we also care about other species, that we are aware of what we do and the actions we take. Yeah, and I think one of the terms that I, uh, or concepts I refer to is that, for example, a lot of people look back at Teddy Roosevelt as our mm -hmm. uh, icon for hunting, but he personally regarded himself as a hunter conservationist right. and a naturalist. Right. He wasn't just about shooting the animals. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to look on his image as a hunter conservation to say that if we want modern, modern hunters to be considering themselves as hunter conservationists, those are the ones that need to be making the switch to non-toxic camel because I don't think someone who wants to be considering themselves a conservationist would knowingly be leaving eagles exposed to poisoning. That, right. That's not conservation. Right. Because well, way back in fifth grade, we had a course in conservation. and. and uh, and one of the precepts of that was you know, wise use without waste. Well, mm -hmm. uh, why would you waste bald eagles just because you want to shoot deer when you have an alternative that won't kill the eagles? Right. And uh, the other thing I tell people is that you know a good bullet shouldn't kill twice. <laughs> it should kill that deer and then it, that, then it's done. Right. So that's interesting because on one one hand, with with the geese while you're at Lac of Parle, you know, it was a legislative decision, a policy decision, mm -hmm. or a regulation decision. Um, by, by the government, and on, on this side of things, it's more of a, a grassroots, I want to call it grassroots effort to try to build awareness, yeah. and uh, I know, you know, when, when it has risen to a political level in the past, um, that gets kind of, the message gets diluted a little bit, yeah. and and it, it becomes a black and white issue versus you know, what, what's the important thing coming out of right. this. Right, and that's where the science tends to go out the window. Right. And, and uh, you lose your, your momentum or your logic uh, in terms of justifying what it is you stand mm -hmm. for. And, and so we just have to provide the information and, and do it in a, a non-volatile manner where we're saying, okay, well, just look at the evidence. Uh, 
several years ago, uh, Pat Redding and I had visited with Bud Grant about uh, deer hunting. And mm -hmm. Bud is an avid, avid hunter. He's shot over 140 deer in his life. And uh, we encouraged him to try uh, federal trophy copper bullets that fall for deer mm -hmm. hunting. And we had asked him if he ever tried copper, and he said no. And, and uh, I called him after deer season, but he said he hadn't seen any bucks that he really wanted. And yeah. So then I called him in the next year again. And he shoots a 30 odd six, and and, uh, and asked how he did. He says, "Well, I hope these bullets last a long time because I didn't use very many." I said, "Well, what do you mean?" He said, "Well, I shot twice to sight in my gun." I went out to Montana and shot a mule deer buck with one <laughs> shot, dropped it, and then came to back to Minnesota, went to Alexandria, and shot a whitetail buck with one shot. So I only used four bullets, <laughs> and at that point I think he was like 86 or 87, and yeah. he, he was hoping they would last in his future years for yeah. the rest of his deer hunting experiences. But and so then I said, well, what was your opinion? He said, they performed well, mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> and uh, it was just fun to listen to him talk about his experience because he, he takes it very matter-of-factly and yeah. tried it and it worked. Nice. So th this is a, and, and you can speak towards this, but this is a, a major, well, this is a an issue that we're, it's going to be discussed this fall at the TWS conference in Albuquerque, but it's also something that we're dealing with here in Minnesota and, and you're kind of the lead on that, so in many ways. so. Um, so this is very much connected to the Wildlife Society in our efforts. Right. This is a really important issue for the Wildlife Society because they had this as the focus of their uh, annual meeting uh, in 2012, and it really struck home to a lot of people that here's an issue that you know, if hunters don't adapt, it's going to make them look bad if, if, if they're saying, well, we don't care if the eagles die because we just don't want to change. Mm -hmm. Because not wanting to change is not a good reason. Right. And, and so we're trying to put this in a positive light and, and help you know hunters maintain that image as hunter conservationists and, and yet still we're you know through the non-game program we're trying to do a lot of other things in terms of research on non-game wildlife species of, of many kinds uh, and then you know we've been able to reflect now on the fact that we've been working with trumpeter swan restoration for 35 years uh, and that's a program that I started right. back in the... I was hoping you'd bring that up, so... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this one started, you know, actually I mentioned it to Roger Holmes in my first interview for this job about well, what were the prospects for reintroducing trumpeter swans. And at that point, they were extirpated from Minnesota. There were a few swans being propagated by then Hennepin Parks, now mm -hmm. the Three Rivers Parks, but the population hadn't really grown beyond maybe five or six pairs being west of the Twin Cities. And so between 1981 and 82, I worked with Dr. Jim Cooper at the university and we put together a, a restoration plan with uh, a goal of uh, 20 breeding pairs in the state. <laughs> and now we're, we're looking at probably a population of maybe 25,000 birds in right. the state. Yeah. And so I made trips to Alaska for three years, uh, 86, 87, 88, brought the birds back, or the eggs back, and then we hatched them at the Carl Savory Game Refuge using the old pheasant egg incubators. So we were able to recycle that equipment. Yeah. And, and then we made two pens to rear the birds in. And, and that was an interesting le learning lesson because from Canada goose propagation, people discovered that if you raised all your young geese in the same pen, they all kind of consider themselves brothers and sisters. And they wouldn't pair bond afterwards oh, when they were turned yeah. loose. So we had to raise two separate pens of birds so that when they got turned loose they were, there were some strange birds that yeah. would intrigue them for, for um, <laughs> bonding. Yeah. And uh, we've now released probably oh, about 340 plus birds uh, over the, especially the first 20 years, mm -hmm. mostly up in the Tamarack National Wildlife Refuge right. area in Beckert County, which is fantastic habitat yeah. for these birds. And I spent the summers of, what, 2000. Uh, nine to 2012 up there and a little bit of 13 and, and you can still go there and on Flat Lake behind mm -hmm. the refuge headquarters and see you know 200 plus sub adults in the summer just oh, hanging out and then they fly into the ne nearby fields and, and eating and it's mm -hmm. just, there's just a gorgeous amount of 
of Trump responded. Uh, and it, it's generated so much positive interest, not just in the swans, but the fact that you know they they depend on good wetlands. Mm -hmm. uh, and one thing that's been very interesting about them is that I expected they would essentially disperse southward into the prairie pothole country, mm -hmm. like down into Otter Tail County and more open country. But what they did is they moved to the north and northeast up into the forested Tamarack bog country. Yeah. And that was exactly the kind of country where I collected the eggs in Alaska. I collected 50 eggs per year for three years, yeah. brought them back. And uh, Rod King from the Fish and Wildlife Service was the pilot who took me out and, and he had identified all the lakes that had swans and, mm -hmm. and where the pairs were and we'd land and taxi up with their float plane. Uh, and then I would get out and uh, leave two viable eggs and then take the rest, and, you know, sometimes four, five eggs for mm -hmm. a larger nest. And uh, then we kept them in insulated suitcases, uh, heated on the way back, uh, courtesy of uh, Northwest Airlines. Yeah. <laughs> and so all of this effort uh, generated just a huge amount of interest in this, bringing the species back and then solving all the techn technical problems of mm -hmm. the techniques because we were the, the first state in the Midwest uh, to do this. And then when the dispersing eventually started, when, when the birds were breeding, they moved up into the bog country. And again, that was the same kind of habitat where I collected the eggs. And in some cases, the swan nest would be within, say, 30 or 40 feet of a loon nest. So the, they were going into loon habitat mm -hmm. more than uh, canvasback habitat, I guess you'd right. say. And now they've continued dispersing into southern, southwestern Ontario, mm -hmm. southeastern Manitoba. They're moving into North Dakota. And then Iowa, Wisconsin, and Michigan have also initiated their own restoration projects. So a bird that was virtually gone from the entire Midwest mm -hmm. is now making a really, really incredible recovery and doing so you know, virtually within my own lifetime. I, I didn't think I would see this within a, a lifetime. Right. Yeah, well, you know, growing up in, in southern Ohio, it, it was a very similar story with us in bald eagles. You know, growing up, we never saw bald eagles, and now mm -hmm. it's populations are rebounding, you mm -hmm. know, because people are dealing with, you know, the population rebounding from effects from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, but they're also, you know, dealing with these other issues mm -hmm. on the landscape. So, um, you know, we'll get calls from my parents still saying, oh, there's a bald eagle, in this, <laughs> you know, in Brown County, Ohio, and and this and that, but coming up here and seeing, you know, the, the massive amounts of, of wild birds, supposed oh. to be iconic birds and loons and yeah. swans and eagles uh, around here. And the eagles, uh, in the 1980s, a number of other states were pretty much out of eagles. Mm -hmm. And they were trying to get restoration programs underway. And they figured out basically that you can't move the eggs, that doesn't work well. Uh, and so they asked Minnesota for eagle chicks that were near fledging. So over, over through the years, uh, mid-1980s up to early 90s, we were donating five eagle chicks per year to various states. So we provided chicks to uh, New York, to uh, Kentucky, to Georgia, Missouri, uh, all of these states, uh, and Georgia, was, mm -hmm. uh, they all needed eagles. And so I, I organized the collection of the eagles here. And over a period of about 10 years, we donated uh, 55 Minnesota wow. eagles to help these other states. And uh, now they're doing really, really well you know, Excellent. throughout that entire range. But uh, we had to kind of soft pedal that effort because there were some people who, you know, they were so protective of eagles, they weren't sure they wanted us to share any eagles with anyone. Mm -hmm. But I felt that you know, five eagles out of our whole state population was something we could afford and it wasn't going to be right. a, a detriment to our own eagle population. And and now uh, we probably have well over, you know, it could be eight or 10,000 eagles or more. Uh, the irony of it is that we've got so many eagles, they're doing so well, that it's hard to justify spending what could be 50 or $60,000 to do a comprehensive statewide survey mm -hmm when there are other higher priorities for endangered and threatened species sure. uh, and, and, and much more rare habitats in mm -hmm. the state. So uh, at, at some point we have to be able to just kind of lean back and, and relax and say, they're doing fantastic. Uh, we don't need to be investing the same level of intensive management or restoration work that we mm -hmm. did before. And for some people that's 
hard to do because they get imprinted on a certain species and they just don't want to walk away from it. Right. Sure. So like, you know, in, the, in those events, you know, engaging, like you talked about earlier, engaging the public to maybe take over some of that mm -hmm. work for you in the meantime, you know, and, and survey your eagles or, or, you know, report issues that you see. Right. They let us know if there's a problem. Right. If an eagle nest blows down or, or yeah. something like that. Uh, and then the other early big success we had was you know, working with uh, the Raptor Center at the University of Minnesota, the Bell Museum of Natural History, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, other organizations for reintroduction of peregrine falcons. And that again was where there had been an earlier effort in the late 80s to reintroduce peregrines and, and they just didn't have enough birds to work with. And at the point that the checkoff passed, mm -hmm. 1980 to 81, that's when I, I called uh, Pat ready to get the Raptors and I, guess what we've got enough money we could help sponsor a, a, a renewed effort to bring back the Falcons and so they provided a lot of the technical expertise the, and uh, the University of Minnesota through Bud Tordoff uh, he was just a, a super inspiration on mm -hmm. on bringing back the Paragon that we teamed up and we began that effort which is now uh, very very successful and we've got Paragons nesting up and down the Mississippi River, Southeast Minnesota, the metro area, up in the Duluth area on cliffs where they nested long ago. And, and again, these are some of the more early focused efforts for these high profile species where now we really appreciate the fact that if, when we do take on a challenge, we have enough technology and we've got enough talent mm -hmm. to make good things happen. Yeah. And by pooling money, resources, people, that's, I think, is one of the keys in the non-game program is, is the ability to network because we don't have enough people, we'll never have enough money to do all these things by ourselves. But by having a collective vision of what we want to accomplish, that's where really good things happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you guys have a great reputation as well, so that always helps. Well, we try. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we got a great, great staff. We've got yeah. regional specialists out in the state, uh, mm -hmm. um, Bemidji, Grand Rapids, Brainerd, uh, down in Rochester, New Ulm, mm -hmm. in the Twin Cities. And so local issues can be addressed by these people mm -hmm. as well as with our overall staff. And, and in addition to the field staff, we have uh, people like Jan Wells, uh, Janine Cohn working on educational programs for the state, uh, Project Wild, Project Wet. Mm -hmm. um, and, and all of these things together, you know, I just don't think you can have a good conservation program without having a good conservation education program. And sometimes when budgets get tight, the education programs are the first things that fall off the plate. And I've seen this happen in other agencies and in other programs, and it's, it's really sad because uh, that's where we're losing our chance for recruiting our nation's future conservationists. Mm -hmm. And I think that recruitment issue is something we, whether you're a hunter or a non-hunter or just a conservationist, we need to get kids outdoors because everything else, it, Everything else is drawing them indoors to some place that's close to the plug-in for their computer or their tablet or whatever. And people need to have some of the same fun experiences mm -hmm. like I experienced as a kid, exploring the creeks and the, the, the bushes for bird nests and, and uh, having a lot of these personal things that just bond you with, so tightly with the outdoors. And like just the issue of trapping, you know, that's mm -hmm. kind of uh, off the, the charts now in terms of uh, interest by the public, right. and yet that was one of the early things that got me interested. Not that trapping is going to have a resurgence in interest, but mm -hmm. it was one of those connections to the outdoors, and so what we have to do is find new connections. And that's what we did in, in the non-game program with what we call the Digital Bridge to Nature, mm -hmm. where we had an estate donation to the non-game wildlife fund, and uh, that gave us enough money to help acquire 500 Nikon cameras that we put into kits that could be sent out to school teachers. Mm -hmm. And so then we did several years of teacher workshops teaching the teachers how to teach the kids, first of all, how to use a camera, because a lot of people, they just want to turn it on and start shooting. Right. That's, that's not good enough. And we had to actually teach the teachers how to do that because yeah. they just wanted to turn it on and start shooting. But we had to teach them how to not only use the camera, but then how to take the kids out on what we called a, a backyard safari basically, photo mm -hmm. safari, to photograph bugs, nature, birds, whatever they could find. Mm -hmm. And it was 
magic. We, we reached probably over 60,000 school kids over those several years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, by using the, the technology of cameras, we found that there were lots of kids who never had touched a camera before. And when they looked through the lens, they were seeing a whole new world. Mm -hmm. And those are the kinds of experiences where, unless you have some type of coordinated effort, those things don't happen, those connections don't happen. And they might live 10 minutes from a nature center in the Twin Cities and they'll never see it because yeah. nobody ever motivated them to go there. Right. Or not even know about it. Yeah, or not yeah. even know about it. Well, good. And you've done things um, internationally as well as far as education goes. Yes. Uh, we were, we're working with a group of uh, people at the Guanacaste Dry Forest Conservation Fund. Uh, Dan Jansen is the professor from the University of Pennsylvania. And he's a world-renowned entomologist. Uh, he's received the Crawford Prize, which is the biologist equivalent to the Nobel Prize for his oh. work in entomology. And he was one of my professors in grad school when I was studying in Costa Rica. It, and that alone was kind of an uh, interesting story because one of my professors stopped me in the hall one day at the University of Georgia and asked if I'd like to go study in Costa Rica. And I said, sure. And then I went back my office to get a map to see where Costa Rica was. <laughs> you know, I grew up on a little farm in Iowa where we hardly ever traveled more than 25 miles from home. And yet it was a life-changing experience where I took a course, first of all, in uh, tropical grasslands agriculture to look at agricultural patterns in the tropics. And then I took one in tropical ecology mm -hmm. where Dan was one of my professors way back in 1969. Well, he's still working too and uh, doing wonderful things with uh, his entomology research. But he also has people on the national wildlife, uh, in the national park system in northwestern Costa Rica in this dry forest area in a little uh, quiet seaport town called Guajina Guaj mm -hmm. And they take these kids out, the junior high level kids, on their own photo safaris mm -hmm. to learn about the wildlife of their area. And now they just got a grant to do DNA studies of wood thrushes down there by misnetting the wood thrushes and then taking DNA samples and learning where those wood thrushes have come from. Sure. And these are kids where this was a, a dying seacoast community where they've overfished the fish mm -hmm. and the parents have boats but they weren't you know, catching anything. And then when they started realizing that if they provided their boats for researchers, they could study the marine environment there and learn all kinds of wonderful things. So they started contracting with the researchers, but there was really no future for the kids there. Hmm. And so Dan and then the people at the uh, Guanacaste National Park started taking the kids out on these forays to learn about the environment, the habitats. And then this ties in with the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies with their Southern Wings program. Hmm. So then I got, actually I got legislation passed in Minnesota to authorize funding from the non-game wildlife program to go to southern wings in Costa Rica, which sounds like that would be impossible to do nowadays. <laughs> yeah, right. But I said, well, we've been sending money to Canada for years yeah. for Ducks Unlimited to Definitely. help wetlands so we could raise more mallards and right. the prairie pothole ducks. I said, if we can send money to Canada for waterfowl, why can't we send money to Costa Rica for songbirds? Mm -hmm. And they, they really couldn't counter that argu argument very well. So they passed the legislation. And so we provided startup funding. And then we got matching donations from uh, people who we've led down there on, on uh, bird watching trips. Mm -hmm. um, so we bought cameras and binoculars for these school kids. And again, it, it, just like in the Digital Bridge to Nature in Minnesota, it, it inspired them to get outdoors. They were taking wonderful mm -hmm. pictures of wildlife on these forays. And now they're actually involved with wildlife research. So now they want to become a future biologist or a park mm -hmm. ranger or a naturalist, a guide. Right. And so there's a future where they can find a place in nature uh, with that, an occupation that will keep them in their local town. And I've been out with these kids on some of these forays and it's just really inspirational mm -hmm. to see that, you know, they're just as inspired as kids in Minnesota when you get them into the outdoors. Right. It's just a matter of finding that connection. Right, which is an important aspect to think about when you're when you're talking about uh, recruitment of conservationists. You know, it's when you're when you're especially in urban areas or places where you know hunting is not a traditional use mm -hmm. of wildlife, where people aren't connecting that way anymore. You know, thinking about what, el what other tools can we put in their hands? It's going to 
you know, have similar effects where they want to go and they're intrigued by nature and they want to learn about, you know, wildlife species and, and right. fishery species. So. And the cameras are really, really good in that regard because <clears throat> it's one thing to look through binoculars and see something. Mm -hmm. But you find with the cameras, the kids can't wait to get back and put their pictures up on the screen right. and then share them with their friends. Mm -hmm. And so it provides an additional technological technique mm -hmm. to get the kids not only involved but for sharing and getting more interest and showing other people what they're doing. And, you know, there's such an array of everything from cell phone cameras to, uh, like, we get, provided them with uh, Canon 50 power mm -hmm. uh, cameras for their, yeah. their uh, forays down there. Uh, they were taking some wonderful pictures uh, after being instructed on how to use them. So, sure. Uh, these are the people that are helping look after our migratory birds, mm -hmm. what we call our birds, when they get down <laughs> in the tropics to, to, for wintering. And, right. and some of these birds actually spend more months in their wintering grounds in places like Costa Rica than they do in Minnesota. Right. And so in the long term, again, we need to be providing that broad vision mm -hmm. of not just looking after the wildlife on our back 40, but saying, okay, we need to know where they go in the rest of the year. and uh, how are those habitats being looked at? And these are the kids who are going to grow up to help protect those wintering habitats. Right. And it's just interesting to see that trend, you know, in, in wildlife science uh, um, and management from going from strictly production, let's produce more, more of what we want, to looking at you know full full year yes. annual cycles and understanding what is needed at all these different sites. The, mm -hmm. You know, not it's not just about the breeding habitat in Minnesota. It's also about the the wintering habitat in Costa Rica and Colombia yeah. and all those types of places. Yeah. So. And the other big lesson we've had with that kind of uh, lesson is working with the loons over the past seven years where we had the Deep Horizon oil spell mm -hmm. in 2010. And at first, you know, we would see the news about the loss of life, which was tragic. And then we were seeing pictures of the brown pelicans and other birds totally soaked in oil, which mm -hmm. was really sad. And that's when it started dawning on me we've got some migratory birds that would have been down there too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was kind of a, a tertiary, tertiary level of awareness where then the question arise, arises, well, what is happening to them? How badly were they damaged? How many died? Or is this a long-term problem? And uh, that, what really spurred this on is that in May of 2010, uh, Senator Amy Klobuchar called a meeting in the Twin Cities for people to get together who were in conservation groups and the agencies to look at, okay, what did happen? What species were most likely to have been impacted by the spill? And so we had a working group after that that came to the conclusion, okay, the two birds we have the best data on long term mm -hmm. and most likely could have been affected were the common loon and the American white pelican. So at that point, we put together a proposal to what's called the LCCMR, the Legislative Citizens Commission for Minnesota Resources, to study those two species and see what kind of impact there was. And this evolved into three separate se uh, sequential projects over the past seven years that just finished up in June now, where we were looking, first of all, at the loons in Minnesota, capturing them, banning them, putting on satellite transmitters mm -hmm. and also geolocators to monitor their migration and their diving behavior. And then we were collecting dead loons from people who found them incidentally. And we were collecting loon eggs that didn't hatch to find out how polluted mm -hmm. those might be. Uh, and then we took feather and blood samples from live loons that we captured through night lighting. And the, the overall project gave us the connection between the fact that our loons were then going to the Gulf of Mexico, they were wintering in areas where a lot of the pollutants would have settled. And one of the ironies of the whole oil spill is that not only did we have the petroleum contaminants that were creating problems, but they also distributed like 800,000 to a million gallons of dispersant, mm -hmm. which didn't make anything break down. It just made the oil settle from the surface, so you couldn't see it from satellite or airplane. And, and it was just kind of floating around like a big blob under the surface. Yeah. And eventually it would have settled offshore from like Alabama and the west coast of Florida. And it turns out that that was also a carcinogenic material that was really bad. 
and, and we shouldn't have been using it in the first place. Uh, and so we were monitoring the, the dispersant as well as the contaminants with contaminant research uh, and analysis mm -hmm. with the University of Connecticut, which d did a lot of the assays for um, other studies being done related to this oil spill. And then we worked with the U.S. Geological Survey Office in Kevin out of uh, mm -hmm. La Crosse, and they came up each summer and we were trapping loons, marking them, monitoring their migration, and we just learned a huge amount about the whole life cycle of the loons. Sure. We found out that they go in late December, early, or late November, early December to Lake Michigan. Mm -hmm. They start at the north end of Lake Michigan, then they work their way down to the southern end, and they're feeding on freshwater gobies on the bottom. They're going down like 150 feet, feeding on these exotic species, gobies. And then they migrate to the Gulf. And again, they're going right to the spot where the, all the crud from the oil spill would have settled on the bottom. Yeah. And then we, from the geolocators that we re covered in the following year back in Minnesota, we found they were again feeding right to the bottom, like 125 or 30 feet down on whatever would have been down in the food chain mm -hmm. surrounded by these contaminants. And we found the contaminants in the feathers, in the blood, in the eggs, in the dead loons. Um, and so in addition to the, the loons that were killed outright and the pelicans that were killed outright by the oil spill, then there's this sublethal effect which you know, it's really hard to assess what the long-term impact is. It could right. be longevity, it could be reproduction, it could be hatchability in the eggs. But we know that there were, there were multiple impacts from that oil spill based on this study. And so the uh, Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund really made this all happen because uh, we, they provided us with $641,000 over the mm -hmm. seven years and now we've just, as of May of 2017, we submitted uh, a remediation uh, proposal to the Fish and Wildlife Service for six million dollars for loon work over the, over three years for restoration mm -hmm. and conservation work, and also some funding to look at uh, working with a pelican colony in southern Minnesota where high water has been flooding a pelican colony off of an island and forcing them onto adjacent cornfields where they're creating problems for the farmer. And we're trying to get the birds back on the island where they won't be creating a, sure. a controversy for the, the farmland there. And this would be a three-year installment, and the whole restoration proposal covers 15 years. So we could get up to f five allocations of funding, and it could be up to $40 million or more wow. if it goes the full term. So that's a pretty good return on that initial research investment. Definitely. And that's why you know, our program, it needs to cover habitat, it needs to do research, it needs to education, do education. All these things make for a good comprehensive program that I, I think the people of Minnesota appreciate. Mm -hmm. that, uh, it, it shows that we're you know, trying to make the best decisions for the, the long-term welfare of all right. kinds of wildlife. Right. That's excellent. Um, just quickly, um, We've been talking about an hour now, but there's a few other things that I think sure, we'd ahead. like to cover. Um, you talked earlier about your your educational experiences, um, um, but you haven't, uh, and I'll uh, just mention how those led to meeting your wife and, uh, and oh, your okay. children. Sure. So. Uh, well, I, I mentioned that my professor, uh, Jim Jenkins, at the University of Georgia, I just asked me if I'd like to go study in Costa Rica. And he was one of the board members for the Organization for Tropical Studies. And he had had other grad students who went down there and they were just totally inspired by the experience. Mm -hmm. So he thought that's something I would really like. And so I went down in February of uh, 1969 for this first course in uh, tropical grasslands agriculture. And it was you know, a field course where we would go out for like four or five days and we come back to San Jose uh, basically get cleaned up and, and uh, have a day or two rest and then go back out mm -hmm. in the field again. And on one of our trips back to San Jose, I, I, another friend and I went into the orientation dance for the University of Costa Rica because their school year was just starting. And that's where I met my wife, uh, Ethel, uh, Ethel Gonzalez. And she was the chaperone for her sister who had a date for the dance. 
but you know the chaperone was an important tradition at that time. So mm -hmm. I spotted her sitting by herself at a table and asked her to dance. And, and again, that brings in another lesson. I, I didn't know any Spanish when I went to Costa Rica. So one of the Costa Ricans in our farm group uh, said, okay, well, when you go to the dance, you really only need to know one word, bailamos, which means shall we dance. Yeah. And then you know she'll come out, she'll dance, and then she goes back to her chair, and then you go back to our, where we're sitting. And so I, you know, with my feeble understanding of <laughs> one word, <laughs> I asked Ethel to dance, and it was very nice. And, and then she started talking to me, and I had to kind of shrug my shoulders yeah. and say, I, I don't speak more Spanish. And, and it turns out she had been in San Diego for a year after she graduated from high school in Costa Rica. She went and took the senior year in San Diego just to learn English. So she actually spoke English. Oh. <laughs> so we, we, we hit it off right away. And then each time yeah. I would come back in San Jose, we would visit, we'd go to a movie. And then since I wanted to take her to a movie, then I had to bring her sister along as the chaperone. And uh, so at the end of that trip, uh, then uh, we kept corresponding over the summer. And then I got approved for the second course yeah. in uh, tropical ecology, which is the one that Dan Jansen was teaching. And so I drove down to Costa Rica from Georgia, which was a big adventure by itself. And uh, at the end of that ecology course, then we got engaged. And then in December of 69, I flew back to Costa Rica with my parents mm -hmm. and two uh, neighbor ladies who were all excited about us getting married down yeah. there. And so we got uh, married in a, a Catholic church down there uh, in December of 1969. And uh, I still tease my wife that you know the ceremony was in Spanish, and each time the priest looked at me, uh, that I said, see. Sí. And I, <laughs> I, I still don't know quite what I had agreed to. Uh, agreed to, but we've been married for 48 <laughs> years now. So uh, whatever it was, it's working. <laughs> yes, good. <laughs> and uh, then our son, Craig, we have one son. and. Uh, he now works at the Federal Reserve Bank, uh, lives in Brooklyn, works downtown in Manhattan. But he grew up hunting and fishing with me, uh, mm -hmm. hunting deer and ducks and pheasants and, and uh, the whole array of farmland game mm -hmm. uh, out at Lackley Pearl. And we went fishing a lot as, when he was a little kid. Um, so he grew up with a really strong outdoor interest. And, and now he's in the middle of New York City. So. Uh, he still enjoys getting outdoors, and the family came out here this past Fourth of July weekend, mm -hmm. and, and uh, we went fishing up in Gull Lake. And they, we have two grandsons now, ten and four, and we introduced them to pan fishing, and they just yeah. had a ball. So, uh, you know, the, the outdoors is still a, an important part of our life. And then uh, I, I own half of our original family farm back in Iowa near Zering. Uh, my mother passed away in 2003, and my two brothers and I split up parts mm -hmm. of the farm and I got the south half which had the creek on it and all the CRP, yeah. all the pheasants and other wildlife, <laughs> and meadow larks and bobolinks. And uh, so in, in owning that, uh, to me it's important to maintain habitat for wildlife. And I grew up, you know, since the early 60s, avidly hunting wildlife on our farm and especially pheasants. I love pheasant hunting. Mm -hmm. And that was back in the days when the pheasants were just incredibly thick down there. And you know, there was one week where I remember getting my limit seven days in a row, which is wow. pretty amazing. That would be pretty <laughs> hard to do nowadays. Yeah. Um, but now we get the family together on the first weekend of November every year for what we call Fez Giving. So we have our annual pheasant night in the morning, and then we have our whole family, nephews, nieces, brothers, sisters, and Mm -hmm. aunts and uncles all get together for a Thanksgiving potluck at the local American Legion in the afternoon and into the evening. Mm -hmm. And what's fun about that is that if you try to get all these grown-up nieces and nephews and family together at Thanksgiving or even at Christmas time, they can't do it anymore because they've got their in-laws and right. family fighting over who gets them for those holidays. Right. But if you try to round them up on the first weekend of November, they're all available. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we'll have about, about 60 to 70 Hendersons all gathering uh, for Fez giving. And not all of them hunt pheasants, but they all enjoy the, the sure. potluck supper. And I think it's nice to build a family tradition around that hunting legacy where 
you know, my uncle used to fly out. He used to work in the Pentagon in the Air Force mm -hmm. in, in Washington, D.C., and he would come out for the pheasant hunting. He loved pheasant hunting. Um, and so that kind of a tradition, you know, extending from the early 60s onwards and then evolving into the Fez giving tradition, mm -hmm. uh, it's part of that outdoor legacy within our own family where I can, you know, through the habitat I keep on my part of the farm, it gives people the habitat they need to have a, a nice right. hunt each year. That's excellent. And then all your so all your time in Costa Rica, you've also written quite a few guidebooks for it uh, and, and other and other books. <laughs> yeah, so. I've, I've done uh, thirteen books uh, over the years. Five of them were written for the DNR, and you know, the, one of the things that happened on one of our trips, a family trip to Costa Rica, in nineteen eighty five, is that we were getting out of our car up in Guanacaste at, at by a, 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 a motel. And here was Bud Grant getting out of the car next to us. <laughs> and uh, there were several yeah. sportsmen who were with him on a fishing trip. And uh, Karen Johnson from Preferred Adventures Travel in, in St. Paul was escorting this group on this hunting and fishing fam tour, what they called it, familiarization tour to help promote Costa Rican tourism. Yeah. And uh, so Karen and Bud invited us over to the happy hour where they were staying. And we were just stopping for a little pit stop, but we spent happy hour with with them and it was so much fun visiting with Bud because what was interesting to me is he never mentioned football once. Yeah. He, what he wanted to talk about were the wood ducks that nested in his wood duck boxes and his property up in northern Wisconsin and the fact that he had ravens for pets when he was a kid and they were really, really smart. And, <laughs> oh, yeah. and all of these things and then, uh, you know, we got, Bud and I have been corresponding and keeping in touch by phone every month or so ever since then. It, yeah. It's it's really fun to see what an avid sportsman he has been over the years and, yeah. and he's interested again in the whole array of yeah. wildlife, not just what he's hunting. Mm -hmm. And he, he's worried about the declines he sees in songbirds. And, and from that first trip, Karen Johnson then called me back after I got back home and said, would you be interested in leading bird watching tours to Costa Rica? And I said, well, I'm not sure. I've never done anything like that, but we could give it a try. Mm -hmm. So in 1987, we, my wife Ethel and I, uh, and with her background from Costa Rica and knowledge in Spanish, that was the perfect match for right. the, being tour leaders. Uh, we led our first group in 1987, and last January we led our 31st annual bird watching trip to Costa Rica. And in leading the trips, I've taken many thousands of photos of the Costa Rican wildlife. So I've done actually four field guides to the mm -hmm. wildlife of Costa Rica with the uh, University of Texas Press uh, and taken lots of pictures that I use for educational programs. And then after people had been to Costa Rica with us a couple of times, they said, well, where else are we going to go next? Yeah. <laughs> I said, oh, I hadn't thought about that. So we, we said, well, how about the Galapagos? So we've done yeah. the Galapagos several times. Uh, and now we've done trips all the way from Belize down to southern Chile. Um, Later this year, in, 19, uh, in 2017, uh, we'll be taking uh, a group of 12 people on a bird watching, wildlife watching trip to uh, Patagonia, to the working wow. down from Buenos Aires, Argentina, down yeah. the coast to, uh, to the Valdez Peninsula, down to the Beagle Channel at the far, far southern tip of South America, and then come up into Torres del Paine National Park, and then hoping to visit a new area that's uh, got a pretty good population of pumas present. So we're hoping to. Excellent. We'll get a look at those. So That's exciting. We're, and then next January, we're going back for our 32nd trip to Costa Rica. So, um, you know, the publications, uh, the field guides have been very rewarding on a personal note. But again, with the background that I had in grad school in writing, feature writing, public relations, and so forth, uh, the five books I did for the DNR, Woodworking for Wildlife, Landscaping for Wildlife, uh, lakescaping for wildlife and water quality, and uh, wildlife viewing guide, uh, traveler's guide to wildlife in, in Minnesota. All of these different books have now sold a total of about 300,000 copies. And probably, uh, probably generated uh, about as many dollars, probably a quarter million dollars or more for yeah. the non-game wildlife fund because the non-game wildlife fund Gets all the royalties, mm -hmm. wow. and so I, I guess I've been the biggest donor to our program <laughs> <laughs> over the years. Yeah. And 
you know, it's one of those things where it's reaching a lot of people. It's not for me to make money. It's for me to reach the people mm -hmm. because the woodworking for wildlife, that's a hands-on activity. People mm -hmm. can make, we have people that have ended up building thousands of birdhouses from the designs. And then I've shared this information with other countries. I, uh, back in the 70s, uh, we had a moose biologist from Minnesota named Pat Carnes, who uh, served as a visiting biologist in Russia. And when he got back, he said, you know, there's a lot of cavity nesting birds in Russia that uh, I'll bet that uh, they would appreciate a copy of your Woodworking for Wildlife book. And so he gave me the address to the mm -hmm. Soviet Academy of Sciences, and I sent them a couple of copies of Woodworking for Wildlife, and then I didn't think too much more about it. And about yeah. six months later, I get a very nice formal letter from the Soviet Academy of Science, signed personally by two of their administrators and professors, yeah. saying, thank you very much, we'll keep this in our library, we'll make it available to our biologists for their research and, and uh, management. And then I thought it was really interesting that a couple weeks later, I, I get a letter from the librarian of the CIA asking for a copy of Woodworking for Wildlife. <laughs> so I, I guess I'm guilty of leaking birdhouse secrets <laughs> to the Russians. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, so I guess I'm on some kind of list yeah. in Washington for well, that. But, <laughs> but, and then I shared this. Uh, I was invited as a speaker to the uh, Southeast Forestry University at Harbin, China mm -hmm. back in 2009. And gave presentations about our swan restoration and wildlife management in Minnesota. And uh, we visited uh, one of their field stations in far northeastern China, where they have a bird uh, endangered species called the scaly sided merganser, very, very rare river duck. And so I had brought copies of my woodworking book along, and I said, Well, we've got copies that mm -hmm. work, uh, our designs for the common merganser that works in Minnesota. So they were going to try this out for helping their scaly sided mm -hmm. merganser in, in China. And then I've shared it with biologists in Cuba. And we, I talked to a couple of biologists who were doing work on parakeets, the Cuban parakeet, endangered species in Cuba. And so they tried my wooden nest box designs that were kind of modified from the Kestrel design box. Mm -hmm. uh, and they said it didn't work because the darn birds uh, basically ate the box. They, they chewed out the entrance hole and oh, yeah. it, it, it didn't work. So they figured out they could mix cement and coconut fibers together and make the same design as my wooden box, but the parakeets couldn't eat it. Yeah. And now they've got at least six different cavity nesting species in Cuba, the, their national bird, the Cuban trogon, yeah. the parakeets, and several other birds that are all using their concrete nest wow. boxes for wildlife. And so it's fun to see that there are all these little peripheral benefits that have occurred mm -hmm. in all, all different places around the globe from some of the work that we did that was originally designed just to benefit Minnesota wildlife. Sure. Wow. So while I have you, a few last questions. Um, these are kind of more reflections on the profession. Mm -hmm. um, kind of how have you seen uh, the wildlife uh, or conservation profession evolve um, during your time in it? And um, what do you see uh, for the future? Well, I, I see a lot of really, really big challenges for the future. That a lot of the things that were never even mentioned when I was in graduate school are now big ticket items. Climate change. Mm -hmm. How do you cope with that? How do you deal with that? And then wildlife diseases and in, invasive species. These things have just grown like horrible mushrooms under our noses and mm -hmm. they basically dominate budgets and time and personnel demands above and beyond just thinking about how do we advance our wildlife legacy traditions, our populations, hunting and recreational pursuits? And I think, uh, and then you've got the, the, that combined with the factor that the traditional supporters, like the members of, say, Ducks Unlimited and uh, a lot of these other hunting groups, the recruitment is not working mm -hmm. to the fact that those numbers are declining every year. And that's been a big part of our support base for funding, not just from the license revenue, but also from the money that those people would donate at their annual banquets and so forth. And, and these, you find out when you look at some of these uh, surveys being done that kind of at the point of about 65 years of age, the knees give out, something gives out, yep. and, and the hunting traditions end because mm -hmm. the people just can't get out in the field very well anymore. 
And yet, for people who are into bird watching, we've had people go on trips to Costa Rica with us up to 93 years of age, and they're just having a ball. Mm -hmm. So, it's the the bird watching is not as rigorous as say the pheasant hunting, uh, the duck hunting. Sure, it, it's it's not as physically demanding, and so people are able to continue that like for another couple decades, mm -hmm. which to me is pretty amazing. Right. Um, we had a trip, and the other thing is that a lot of these people who are doing the international travel are women. We took a group of a dozen people to Brazil in 2012, and they were all women, and they were all over 80. <laughs> and so there's, there's a constituency there mm -hmm. that I think is largely overlooked and ignored in terms of bringing in a conservation audience that we need to be involved in helping support funding efforts or conservation initiatives, legislative efforts. We need to be much more inclusive mm -hmm. in bringing in all these people who care about nature, but they're not your traditional license holder, and they don't have the urge to go out and kill a pheasant, mm -hmm. but they care about wildlife. And so we need to be a lot more creative in how we put down some of our previous preconceptions of who our audience is, broaden that, and make it appealing to that whole spectrum of outdoor lovers in a way where hunters are not feeling like their turf is being encroached on, right. that it's helping them to make things successful for the habitats that they all care about. Mm -hmm. And then conversely, we need the, the, people, the people who are the bird watchers to understand that hunting is a healthy component of outdoor management, from mm -hmm. whether, you know, if you're looking at what the impacts of deer or turkeys on the uh, you know, mm -hmm. lower level story of the forest, the brush, uh, shrubs, uh, all of these factors need to be incorporated so that people can understand that hunting is an important component of that overall management scheme and, and that they, it's okay if they're not hunters, but uh, we need to discourage that, that anti-hunting mentality that wants to include exclude the hunters because that's uh, divisive yeah. within our midst and, and for our future. And I find a lot of a lot of energy is spent on bickering between those two groups. Right? Yes. When, when they care about the same things and they support the same things. Mm -hmm. um, um, but they spend so much time and effort and money debating each other when mm -hmm. they're not really the ones that should be yeah. debating each other. It should be a, a, a collaborative approach. Yeah. And one of the important lessons I've learned with our uh, lead and copper ammunition issue is that you've got people who care about eagles or saying we shouldn't be poisoning eagles. That should be a no-brainer. Just don't use lead. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's easy for them to say. And then you have hunters who are saying, I don't want you telling me what I'm supposed to shoot. Right. And then ironically, the hunter goes out and buys ammo but never ask the spouse what kind of ammo they should buy. Should they buy toxic or non-toxic? Mm -hmm. And so it, it would be nice if they, the, the spouse had a say in what kind of ammo that, you know, they're going to get. So, because if, if the spouse knew, they probably wouldn't be bringing in right. tainted venison to the house. Right. So uh, if hunters are going to change, we need to understand that hunters will listen to other hunters but they won't necessarily listen to someone from an agency or necessarily from an eagle protectionist group mm -hmm. saying the same thing because they're going to be suspicious mm -hmm. or not receptive. Right. And so we need to understand how we need to position ourselves in terms of building support with the right kind of advocacy with, in the case of the ammunition. If we can get hunters who have already tried it to share that information through testimonials or just with their buddies or landowners could say, okay, if you want if you want to deer on my property, you have to use non-toxic because I don't want to be poisoning eagles. And then at some point, we need to be able to say that for our own state lands and like state parks, we shouldn't be poisoning eagles in our state parks. And uh, we had a, a situation up in St. Croix State Park several years ago where a woman participating in a mentored hunt mm -hmm. shot uh, a deer with a non-toxic shot, and then. She went back to the headquarters and then she was going to show another member of this party where she had been for her stand because mm -hmm. the other person wanted to hunt there the next day. When they got there, and this was just several hours later, the gut pile was entirely gone and there were nine bald eagles sitting in the meadow around the periphery of where she had shot the deer. Nine eagles had been feeding on that one gut pile. Yeah. And so 
it's affecting a lot of birds and, and, and you know, even a single deer. We have, you know, 500,000 deer hunters and maybe 150,000 deer uh, being taken each year. Mm -hmm. And then you got deer that escape and die. And I, I did some voodoo math and came up with an estimate of about 3 million pounds of deer gut piles and dead deer mm -hmm. that the eagles have available for feeding on each year. That's a lot of free food, mm -hmm. and it would be nice if it was not toxic. So, right. again, we need to work through hunters sharing with other hunters to have the most impact so that we can implement some change. Right. Well, um, I think we could conclude the interview there unless there's any last words of, of encouragement or advice that you might have. For, well, in for the case of the non-game program, you know, we don't have the benefit of that excise tax like we have from Pittman Robertson or uh, Wallet Bro, yep. and formerly Dingle Johnson. Uh, and so we have to work harder than normal because our money basically starts with donations that people mm -hmm. make at, uh, at tax time. So our, our donation rate is low. It's, you know, less than a couple percent out of all Minnesota taxpayers. But it's those taxpayers just making that modest little donation that have made our whole program work. Mm. So it's basically a ground level, grassroots effort for people who care about wildlife to, once a year to say, okay, here's a, a few bucks, and then if I donate, now we can say, okay, we'll match that one to one when they, they mm -hmm. like that. And, uh, and now we provide an opportunity where people can donate online or they can make an estate donation. And each one of those things helps build our income and diversify our income. But that I, I think the best note to leave people with is that Minnesota citizens made this happen with their generosity mm -hmm. and that we have to appreciate that we have a responsibility to put that money to the best use possible for the long-term sure. benefit of Minnesota's wildlife. Great. Thank you, Carol. You're welcome. Thank so. you.